All right, I think we see your slides here, Richard. Would you like to get started? Okay, thank you, T. Um, and thank you to the audience for your interest in the subject area. Um, so let's imagine that you're an astronaut and you're landing on the surface of Mars and you start to open that hatch. And the question is, are you walking into the abyss or do you actually know what the environment is like that you're going to be entering? And on the count of uh, many uh, missions to Mars, including the rovers, as well as um, spaceships uh, circ circumnavigating the planet, we actually know a lot about the environment on Mars. And what we can say is the, that the atmosphere really cannot support aerobic life. Uh, it's a very carbon rich atmosphere. It's 95% carbon dioxide, but it only has 1% of the Earth's pressure. And what that practically means is that water will boil at body temperature. And so if you were to walk outside without a spacesuit, you would boil immediately. Not a good idea. We also know that there's plenty of water on Mars. It's no longer visible on the surface of Mars, but deeply buried in, uh, in sediments and in the soil. Uh, we also know there are polar ice caps uh, and transient glaciers on Mars, but it's been estimated that if that water were actually liquid, it would cover the surface of Mars to a depth of 35 feet. So there's plenty of water that would be available for life. Solar radiation is, is another interesting issue. Uh, the intensity of the light from the sun on the Mars surface is about 60% of that on the Earth, uh, actually. And that's sufficient to support photosynthesis. And at rates of photosynthesis, that would actually allow you to grow plants and other photosynthetic organisms. The challenge, however, is that there is no ozone layer in the atmosphere, nor magnetic field to shield the planet from ionizing radiation. And so there is a tremendous amount of ionizing radiation that could be damaging to living organisms, and that would have to be managed as well. And then fortunately, we also know a lot about the soil on account of the rover activities. Um, it's largely of basaltic origin. The mineral compositions are similar to Earth, uh, there is the presence of perchlorate, which is an oxidant, which could be a challenge, but the mineral composition is sufficient to grow plants. If we can go to the next slide. So the next slide is, is two scenarios uh, for the Martian ecosystem. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Martian movie. Uh, and this uh, particular scene on the left is Matt Damon growing his famous potato field uh, in his uh, Mars colony after he's been abandoned on the surface of Mars. And he realizes that he's going to have to sustain his life for at least a year uh, before he can leave the planet and, and uh, return to Earth. And so famously in this scene, he's planting potatoes um, to uh, supply his food for uh, at least a year. And if you do some quick calculations on, on how many potato plants would be necessary to sustain uh, one human for one year, it would be a field that's about 220 meters squared. And that's assuming that you would get two potato crops per year. So there's no seasons in this uh, enclosed environment. Um, if you sort of eyeball the size of this picture, what Matt has actually planted is probably about half the number of potatoes he really needs. But there's some other important elements that we need to consider for agriculture on Mars. And those are elemental uh, issues. And by elemental, I mean elements such as nitrogen. So nitrogen recycling is going to be a critical element in agriculture uh, on the planet Mars. Um, we also have to be concerned about risk. Any crop that has only two uh, production periods per year is a risky system. Um, we have to wait three to six months for each crop to develop to the point where it can be harvested. And then finally, potatoes, maybe not the best choice. They're largely starched, low in protein, low in lipids, 
And if we're going to take that biomaterial and perhaps transform it into other bioproducts that may be useful for sustained life on Mars, using starting with starch, unless it's processed through fermentation, which I believe Lahira would talk about, uh, is going to limit the number of products that can be generated from a potato cr crop. So the alternative, which is the area that I work in, is algae. And algae actually have a photosynthetic efficiency that's about five times better than crop plants. And so a much smaller surface area would be required to grow algae that would provide sufficient energy, calories, protein, and lipids uh, to support a single person. It's about five-fold smaller uh, than that would be required if you were to grow a crop plant. In addition, many algae can actually reduce nitrogen from the atmosphere into ammonia, and that can be available for protein synthesis. So that allows us to have a circular economy or circular biology uh, around uh, the conservation of elements such as nitrogen. And algae are robust. They can be harvested 24 seven. They recite, we can recycle the water and the nutrients. And very importantly, if the crop fails, it's very easy to restart. And it could be back up in a matter of days. So that reduces the risk. And then finally, the last point I'll touch on is that algae biomass is actually an ideal feedstock for hydrocarbon-based biomaterials. In many of the studies that I've been involved in, in with the Department of Energy, we've demonstrated we can produce a bio crude from algal biomass that has the same chemical properties as petroleum, which of course is a feedstock for many of the plastics and other materials that we consume on Earth. So the question is, is can it work? Can we actually live on the surface of Mars? And if we manage uh, and account for all the mass and energy and the issues around ionizing radiation, I think the answer is probably we can. But also there are very important lessons for Earth because we're facing some of the same issues on Earth. And that is we have linear agricultural systems that don't recycle nutrients, that are energy inefficient, um, and perhaps not as robust as they could be. So I think the lessons that we learned from uh, developing agricultural systems on Mars can actually have applications for the Earth. And I'll finish there, thank you. Can't hear you. <laughs> um, I'm seeing some really, you know, questions here about um, what would cellular agriculture look like in urban. So you're saying not just, you know, planetary, interplanetary, but um, looking here on Earth. So we'll, yeah. we'll get to that. But before we do, I wanted to uh, introduce the hero. So the hero Jayakoti is from Southern Illinois University's Fermentation Space Science Institute. I almost called it the Space Institute. I think I'm like already planning for you here. <laughs> And he uses biotech and microbiology to turn waste into value-added bioproducts. So Lahiro has helped the space for food planners understand the potential of using microorganisms to turn the packaging for food sent into space as feedstock to grow more foods or biomaterials. So um, Dr. Jaya Cody, would you like to take it away? Uh, thank you, Jay. It's nice to have uh, here uh, share our work. And uh, thank you all for participating. I try to give you an overall idea of what we are doing. Um, I'm coming from fermentation, but it's kind of a unconventional fermentation. Now, you, what you're looking here, we already destroy our planet Earth. Uh, do we want to do the same in the moon or the Mars when we colonize? Uh, we have to rely on the plastics as well in the space. Um, so what are our choices? Uh, you know, when um, the let me see how I can slide. Um, hope my slide are moving right now. Um, you know, when we invented the plastic um, in early uh, 1900, uh, Bakelite, then we started our disposal society. Uh, if you take uh, the progress of the um, fast food chain to uh, use the plastic, you know, we are, we are generating huge amount of plastic and rely every day uh, 
activity from morning to um, when you go to the bed, uh, you use uh, plenty of plastic uh, to increase the production 350 million tons right now. Because we not manage uh, these plastic waste accurately, what happened, it's ended up in the ocean because we don't have a techno economically feasible chemical or mechanical recycle system to um, deal with this plastic. Now, my talk is try to connect the Earth scenario into this space in future, not to make this disaster. Right, so yeah, we expected the plastic waste exceed um, the total mass of fish in 2050. You may eat, not may, you definitely eat at least about one um, week a, a credit card amount of a plastic, not only eating, you are drinking as well as you're breathing plastic. So uh, with the pandemic, uh, we know that this enter another huge amount of plastic into the, into the um, atmosphere uh, and also into our ocean as well as into our land. So my idea or what we are doing, we're trying to generate a microbial cell factories that definitely mimic the industrial platform in a single organisms, bacteria, yeast, and fungi. What we're trying to do, we want to feed something into them and want to get a targeted product. How are we going to do this using a synthetic microbiology technique? So what I look into microbes is like, a, uh, is like an electronic circuit. So we can manipulate these um, machineries to get this product out. Now, it's amazing in 2016, we were able to find an amazing organism in Japan that able to use plastic as a soil carbon source, in this case, these PET bottles, right? So what uh, the progress in this area right now within the last five years is tremendous. Uh, one of the company in French uh, called Carboys, they already start a process, economically viable, technically economically viable process to recycle pet bottle into new pet bottle within 10 hours. Now they have the patentable uh, application created and they're going to start this process within five years um, with, uh, collaborating with Nova Nordics. Those are inside. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed that um, there is some incident going on in London. Um, there are a few uh, plane crashes as well as uh, as well as uh, some areas uh, there are fire outbreaks. Have you noticed this? Um, anyway, so that's actually the friction story. One time, uh, this friction story called the Mutant 59, um, I would highly recommend you to read. What it says, the meteoroids ca uh, came to the earth and carrying some of the microorganisms that could eat plastic. So everything uh, made from plastic this can be destroyed with this organism. Now, the other idea is not to destroy the earth, but to um, make something special from this plastic be able to create this organism. Now what you're seeing is our organism able to selectively degrade the plastic. They can eat the plastic and what they can do, they can convert it, this PET. Now this is, I don't want you to um, get attention in this entire slide, but look at in this page, in left to right, what we can do, we can upcycle these monomers. Now we are talking about re not recycling, this is upcycling. You can convert this material into a high property material. For example, you can make a turbines to fill cells to a new type of nylon. These material are exceed the properties of current plastic in the market. So what we did, we think about uh, further, we get this yeast, red yeast, you can convert it plastic into different material, even fuels, chemicals, and also pharmaceuticals, okay? Beyond what we are um, using yeast these days for the bread and wine making. Now in SIU, we have a very nice um, process uh, built up by this uh, uh, professor called Ken Anderson. We can use oxygen and water without any chemical we can dissolve most of the 
uh, biomass or even the coal, plastic, etc. What you're looking here, this side, the microbes, after we dissolving this carbon, this microbe now able to utilize those carbon. What we can do, we can actually make a recirculation process to um, any waste you can get into this system, solubilize and convert it microbially into a high value uh, products. Now, in this case, we are making a green plastic bottle. These are new type of plastic exceeding PET material property. So our project called GP for GT, this is green plastic for green tea. We are collaborating with one of the Japanese company to do this. Now, in future, what we want to do, get all these material and, I mean, the base plastic and the other uh, base material from the biomass you're generating, not only in the Earth, even in the Mars, we want to get these and convert that into high value product. Now, we are looking in one area, that is aerospace 3D printing market, that's going to be uh, having a huge market potential in future. Now you're looking here, we're all may very familiar. This is hangover because of what? The aldehyde, right? So we found our aldehyde. I've been working with this aldehyde called glycoraldehyde. It's a simple sugar we can find in the Milky Way in the space. It's definitely not good uh, aldehyde for us. It's make a protein cross-linking and make a diabetic complication in human. But what we're trying to do we take a microbial approach. This is the everyday event for me now. My 11 months old is it's refusing eating these. So same thing. In this microbe, they're refusing or they are not like this aldehyde and other bad chemical. But we can, I told you at the beginning, we tuning these microbes. We take on the pumps, etc. So here, what you're looking for, the bad ethylene glycol and glycoaldehyde can be converted into a high value polyhydroxyalketone that can be converted into biofuel, biodegradable plastic. Another organism we developed, this can take more than two different toxic chemicals de uh, developing or manufacturing in um, etc. You can have a highly value monomer can be taken through this. Thing. So our technology, we take waste and convert it into high value mission in Mars. So what you're looking here also, see. It looks like, um... Dr. Jack Cody's uh, video has paused. While we wait for him to come back, I have been glued to my screen because it's been such a fascinating presentation. Um, if you all have some questions for either Dr. Sayer or Dr. Jack Cody, please put them in the chat. It seems like we've got, oh, you're back. Okay. I'm sorry. So, oh, you're uh, fine. yes. Yeah. So, uh, Ellen Mars want to, you know, um, make a cannabis in the Mars. So we are thinking uh, generate a new type of compound from cannabis. We have an institute in SIU as well. Finally, I, uh, we have a biotechnology cohen here. We are deliberately working with several institute to make these uh, ways to valorize product happen in Earth as well as Mars in the future. That's it. For your presentation. Um, so I was just in inviting um, people to put in their questions in the chat for both you and Dr. Sayer and noticing that we have an international crowd. We have people coming from Germany and Paris and the very far away state of Colorado. <laughs> so um, thank you for joining us. Um, as you are putting in your questions in the chat, oh yes, applause, applause. So thank you so much. Um, I had you know, just sparking my curiosity in the conversation. Um, Dr. Jai Cody, as you're talking, I'm curious, this new plastic that you're, you've created that is not the PT, is it, is it durable? Yes, it's a durable and it's biodegradable. So can, you can make uh, the product again. So it's 100% recirculation. 
Okay. So it's exceeding the current PET properties. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I had a question for you, Dr. Sayer. So when you're talking about the algae producing, you know, these lipids, carbs, and proteins, what does the food look like? Like you showed this picture and we know what a potato looks like, right? Well, what yes. is algae producing? What does that food look like? Yes. Um, so there are a number of startups as well as DOE programs to develop uh, edible foods using uh, microalgae. Uh, there are a number of products that you can actually buy on the market already, but it's, it's actually an ideal organism to print food. Uh, it's microscopic, it can be sprayed into various configurations. Uh, the primary concern I think is gonna be palatability. Will people actually find it tasty? And uh, in that respect, I think that's where fermentation science can come to play to add uh, uh, additional taste and flavor enhancers uh, to make it much more palatable. But what's important is, is the composition of, of the algae. It's 35% protein. So that's equivalent to soybean. It's a very protein rich source of food. Um, up to 50% is lipid. So it's high energy density like peanut butter. And, and then the, the remainder is carbohydrate. In terms of uh, nutrient composition, uh, vitamins and antioxidants are very rich in algae. Uh, they're actually the source of, of many carotenoids that we find, for example, in salmon, uh, which are very valuable for vision and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly complete food. And I think the only issue is, will it taste good? <laughs> Important question. <laughs> And yeah. we have a question from um, Kevin in the chat. It says, is it possible first to burn the plastic to derive energy from, say, the bottles, burning without adding energy except for initial energy, and then feed the gases to your microbes? This way you could have energy and a valuable product afterwards, if it's possible. What do you all say? <laughs> so, yeah, you're correct. You can get, get a carbon dioxide. Then uh, we have organisms that already made for carbon dioxide capturing, but I don't know how reliable that is. I mean, the the efficiency wise, um, yes, uh, it's carrying a lot of energy, um, but uh, it's depend on, you know, we have to do a really good techno economic analysis to any of these technology to see the feasibility. That's my two cents. Uh, um, good idea, um, but uh, we haven't done it yet. Fabulous idea. <laughs> Is there a world, and this is, a, I guess, a naive question where, you know, Dr. Say, you were talking about some of the algae can produce the precursor products for, for plastics, mm -hmm. where you both would be working together? Yeah, At one so point, we can, definitely. So what we're looking now is uh, uh, connecting synthetic uh, monomers and the biological monomer composite making, not in the composite in the large scale, like, you know, plastic and uh, wood. Not that level. We want to go to molecular level and making the uh, composite. So if Rich making a new precursor, yes, that could be a part of our process. Then you can link and make a new materials. Yes, we are doing that. Not with Rich right now, <laughs> but it's another group. Yeah, I might add that the Department of Energy is sponsoring several programs in the biomaterial space. Uh, to produce uh, monomers for building plastic polymers using microalgae, as well as other uh, microbial organisms. But in addition, uh, we know from past studies that in a process where we take heat and high pressure and directly convert the algal biomass into what's called biocrude, we know from our partners at, um, uh, at Honeywell um, that this material can perform as well or better than petroleum and refineries to produce downstream feedstocks, which of course are the current uh, uh, source of most of our plastics in the world. So we have options, um, which makes it really desirable. And on account of the fact that it's so energy dense with hydrocarbons, it makes it feasible to produce a bio crude that performs just like petroleum. It asks me to ask, you know, you both have, you know, a view and an expertise in, in this area. What industries are using this already and what industries could be using it, but they're not thinking about it? Lahira wants to go first. <laughs> so it's a question for me, right? 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, currently, you know, uh, what the main um, industry we are focusing on, for example, the plastic manufacturers, right? Um, for example, these guys. Um, so making pet bottles, Coca-Cola, um, Nestle, they are eager to develop these technologies. And um, they are in the role and they, they already make uh, really good progress and they're collaborating. And as I told you, it is everyday event, isn't it? Uh, so we rely on plastic. And think about, um, we are making the new concept, actually it's wrong, I would say, on my uh, understanding, maybe Rich um, can give his thought. When you think about biodegradable alternatives, some of the, these biodegradable alternatives also make a massive amount of uh, microplastic and nanoplastic. That's a huge burden for the agricultural field. So we need to think about entire ecosystem and developing you know, uh, microbial-based techniques uh, to deal with also a biodegradable plastic. So uh, that's my point. So it is everywhere. I believe all the industries, 75%, I would say, they are relying on plastic, right? Yeah. I might add that uh, there, there are alternatives for plastics in many applications. And one of those biomaterials that is biodegradable and natural uh, in its production, as well as carbon negative, are waxes. And we know that some algae can actually produce wax and metabolize wax. Um, euglena is, is a great example of that. Um, so waxes, we think, can replace plastics in many applications as water and permeable barriers. And as we modify the structures of waxes, we can actually make them thermal tolerant. And in that case, they can uh, replace plastics in many structural applications. So in my group, we've actually engineered very robust, high performing algae uh, to produce waxes in contrast to euglena, which is a very fragile algae, it turns out. Um, it lacks a cell wall, so it doesn't do well in large scale culture. So there, there are many opportunities through metabolic engineering strategies, as Lahiro has uh, mentioned, to not only engineer uh, heterotrophic microorganisms, but also the algae to make these feedstocks and be carbon negative, which is a real plus. And I'm curious, you know, this is talking at the industry level, what would it, what would need to happen to get consumers and supply chain to, to use biomaterials or be more accepting of them? Yeah, so this is a collective effort, not only scientists like us um, dealing with a wet lab, I think uh, there are a lot of social uh, component in here. Uh, we need to uh, we need to educate. You know, uh, I am in like a let's say the rural area. They they don't care about it at all, right? Uh, but we need to have an education system to give these ideas, and also the industry. Um, I think uh, they need to be more innovative uh, to accept. Um, these new technologies. It's risky. It's risky, absolutely risky. So if anyone willing to have a high risk, high reward uh, mm -hmm. and uh, environmental friendly approaches. So it's collectively, again, you have to think about economy, you have to think about social components and the technology. So totally, we need to educate everyone from <laughs> one year old to the, uh, I mean, eight years old. <laughs> I might add another element is economics. And currently, uh, petroleum, of course, is a very low cost material. Uh, to produce biomaterials, we're going to have to achieve parity with petroleum based uh, products. So those alternatives are not going to be picked up by the consumer until the economics are favorable. We're getting there. And with some systems, we're already there. Um, but in the case of algae, uh, we're probably about 80% of achieving the objective of parity with petroleum. And I think with some of the advanced technologies that are coming, particularly in increasing uh, biomass yield and harvesting technologies, 
Uh, we should, I believe, in the next five years, be at a point where we're at parity with petroleum, and then the economic incentive is there to take on carbon negative recyclable materials. Speaking of, you know, the, the I guess the parity or the getting it to the consumer, you know, there's, as people have been staying home this last year, people are starting their own home gardens, right? They're doing a lot of home kinds of projects. What would, how far in the future are we for people to be, you know, uh, cultivating their own algae farms to produce <laughs> their own products? I don't think that'll ever happen. Okay. <laughs> I, it, it's, uh, there's too much technology involved and, um, I think it can really only be done at scale. Now, though there will be exceptions for high value products uh, that uh, a particular consumer or farmer might want to grow locally. But when we're talking about producing food at scale and biomaterials at scale, these are hundreds of thousands of hectare farms. And um, that's not backyard. <laughs> Could you do it on an international space station? I know that's like not backyard scale, but if the goal is space. That's a great issue. Um, and I think the short answer is no. And the reason is water. Um, tremendous amounts of water are required to grow microalgae. In a microalgae pond, the mass of the algae is less than 1% of the mass of the water. So you would have to put in space massive amount of water to grow these organisms. And even though they're more efficient than plants in, term, in terms of producing biomass, they require a lot of water. Now, alternatively, on the surface of Mars, then it becomes feasible because we know there's frozen water, subsurface water in Mars. And it's a matter of mining that water and then keeping it in a closed environment. And then algae becomes, I would argue, perhaps the best alternative um, on account of its ability to grow faster, produce oxygen and fix nitrogen. Yeah, that's what Kevin's saying in the chat too, not even at a bigger housing project, i.e. to serve the needs of the inhabitants in terms of food and also energy and fresh air, as you were mentioning. Yeah, oxygen. Yeah. Oxygen, right. Yeah. And Kevin also said that eco-labeling would maybe help with the consumer adoption. So. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so we have about five more minutes left. Um, I'll save it for chat. I have one more kind of a, a strange question for Dr. Jai Cody, but um, I'll leave it. If anybody wants to put a question in the chat or you can hear my weird question, if you want to continue the conversation with either Dr. Say or Dr. Jai Cody, you're able to connect with them in um, two places. If you go to the people tab over here, there's chat, polls, people, Q&A, and Slido. What you can do is um, schedule a meeting to meet with them later. And then you can meet with several people at a time, or you can go into the networking, which is on the left part of your tab. You'll see reception, sessions, and networking. There'll be networking later, and you'll be able to interact with people um, at random there as well. So there's two opportunities to connect with people. Um, I think that was the you know the best part of, of conferences when you could do them in person, running into somebody at the table, getting a snack or you know a tea or a coffee or something like that. So um, feel free to, to find each other later. Um, so I don't see a question in the Q&A or the chat. So I had another question for you, Dr. Jai Cody, which is when you were talking about those byproducts that are found in space, and just like your 11 month old who is not eating, the peas are not going in. <laughs> so are you envisioning, how are you envisioning pulling those byproducts out of the atmosphere or in space to process them? Like, are you imagining, I don't know, in my head, right? That you have some sort of a, a space um, structure, you're in space, and maybe you're pulling it from the air and then making your own plastics. Is that what we're talking about, or what are we talking about here? So anything you make, the you know any waste you make in the space, any waste um, can be converted into uh, uh, feed for these microbes. So you name it, right? So I show the technology can be adapted uh, and you can actually, what we call actually the funneling, bio funneling. So you can take these different materials into whatever your product. Now, I only talk about the biomaterial part. Remember that you can convert this into meat 
or if you want to make uh, other pharmaceuticals. So there is a lot of potential. Right now, we developing this technology fundamentally that can be adapted um, in, on, uh, in the space to generate all these material. You know, your waste is cut again, come to the material if you want. That's cyclical. Exactly, that's, that's the whole idea. So it's a circular economy. So we try to make the circular economy in here that can be adapted in space. Mm -hmm. well. And what, um, what companies, I guess, besides the like, or, or rather just what's emerging in this era, area as you both see in terms of circular biomaterial economy? What else is emerging in this space? What's cool that you're kind of noticing? Oh, either Dr. Jai Cody or Dr. Sayer. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Oh, just emerging technologies in the um, circular biomaterial economy. Ah, well, um, that's... you know, people are trying all the options right now. I know some people are trying to make um, a plant that can generate this material as well. <laughs> okay, so plant, plant biology is trying that as well. Okay. And then, um, uh, the other point is everyone trying to, for example, the carbon dioxide capturing. So already, already made the technology, some of the companies right now, they capture the carbon dioxide and make like a polyethylene type plastic, already did. Um, so everyone working on this, uh, but again, the challenge, I believe uh, the scalability. Um, so there are a lot of work need to be done, uh, but seems like we are we are closing to that challenge and probably next five years as i told you one company going to be built up in france very soon to recycle these right so that's a huge um huge uh uh achievement i would say so next five ten years we see this in uh, on earth uh, and then we can adapt <laughs> when we go to the mars <laughs> yeah and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Sayer. I just know that the session automatically ends at 9.45, so you can go and join another session if you wanted to say some quick words and otherwise wanted to thank you both, so. Okay. Yeah, I just might add very quickly that uh, most of the systems for producing algae that are uh, under serious development uh, all recycle the nutrients, uh, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, uh, the potassium, et cetera. And that's all part of the harvesting and uh, uh, biomass conversion process. And that's a great system. It, it's perhaps the only system that I'm aware of in agriculture that is a circular system in terms of nutrient use and uh, recycling. That's not the case, of course, in a traditional ground-based agriculture where nutrients go in and they come out in the river and they end up in the ocean and then we have problems. So. Um, we're trying to do a better job in the case of algae than we've done in the past with corn and soybeans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, Kevin had a question about, do you need artificial gravity for- No, that's what I tried to type in actually, yes. Um, that's a really good point. We need um, either, um, zero gravity technique to work with micro that that's something you know uh, people need to think about um, the other option as he said yes we need to have artificial gravity uh, to make the bioreactors um, functional in the aerospace yeah. so it's required yeah. hmm. is artificial gravity needed for the algal um, no no not at all <laughs> but again, I think algae's uh, space in space yes. is that, so, that, that. So that's why I said it's a it's a multi. Um, we need a multidisciplinary approach here. Um, not only like a, a biologist, microbiologist. I said socioeconomist, economist, uh, sociologist, uh, and then uh, engineer. Yes, we have to build up these uh, amazing technologies. I, but I'm very optimistic. We will be there. <laughs> Great. Right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Jacoby. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. So I